Hi, I am Bridget Alton Kirk. I am one of the technical consultants at W Consulting, and today I will be talking you through the clarifications to IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. In May 2014, the new revenue standard, IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers, was released. The standard was a combined project of the ISB and the FASB. The initial effective date of the standard was for years starting on or after 1 January 2017. However, in July 2015, the effective date was deferred by a further 12 months and the standard is now effective for years starting on or after 1 January 2018. After the standard was issued, the boards established the Transition Resource Group, or more commonly referred to as the TRG, to support the implementation of the standard. The group was made up of various representatives of the boards and various other key stakeholders. One of the objectives of the TRG was to inform the boards of implementation issues to help the, with the boards determine what, if any, action should be undertaken to address any interpretation or implementation issues identified with the standard. The TRG met six times since the standard was released and discussed 48 issues submitted to them from various stakeholders. For a majority of the submissions discussed, the TRG determined that there is sufficient guidance in IFRS 15 and that no further clarity was required from the boards. There were, however, five topics which indicated potential differences in views on how to implement or to interpret the requirements of the standard as they were currently included, and these were thus the, the areas which have been addressed by the boards. But before we look within the, into these areas um, and, and through the clarifications which were released in April 2016, let's do a quick recap of the requirements of IFRS 15. So IFRS 15 replaces all current guidance that we have addressing revenue today. This includes guidance under IS 18, Revenue, IS 11, Construction Contracts, and any related interpretations. Today, typically, we're all quite familiar with two different types of revenue recognition models. One, applicable to the, the sale of goods. Typically, revenue is recognized as risks and rewards of the good is transferred to the customer. And the other is for rendering of services. Similarly to your construction contracts, revenue is recognized based on a percentage of completion. IFRS 15 now replaces both of these with a single five-step model. Before we dive into the model and do a quick recap of the five steps, let's quickly address the scope of IFRS 15. IFRS 15 is said to be a residual standard. Therefore, an entity should first assess any contracts under any other applicable standard first. It is not anticipated, though, that any revenue contracts which currently fall within the scope of revenue guidance today would no longer fall within the scope of IFRS 15. The first step in this five-step model is to identify the contract with the customer. A contract is defined as an agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. IFRS 15 introduces five criteria which now need to be met before you can pass step one. The contract needs to meet these the following five criteria. The contract needs to be approved between both parties and parties need to be committed to performing their respective obligations. In other words, the contract must create enforceable rights and obligations. Each party's rights regarding the goods or services to be transferred can be identified. Payment terms can be identified. The contract has commercial substance and it must be probable that the entity will collect the consideration to which it is entitled to in exchange for transferring the goods or services. It is unlikely that step one is going to create too many issues for entities going forward. Step two then requires us to identify the performance obligations. This term performance obligation is new in IFRS 15. Today we typically refer to a multiple element arrangement where there are multiple goods or services which are being transferred to a customer. A performance obligation is defined as a promise in a contract with a customer to transfer a good or service to the customer. The standard, however, requires obligations which are distinct. The objective when determining whether or not a performance obligation is distinct is to consider the performance obligations from the perspective of the customer. And the ISB does acknowledge that there is going to be judgment involved in making this assessment. In order to be distinct, a performance obligation needs to meet the two criterion as indicated on the slides. Firstly, you need to consider can the customer benefit from the goods or services either on their own or together with resources that are readily available to the customer? And is the obligation to transfer goods or services separately identifiable from other promised goods or services in the contract? 
The first criterion basically asks us to consider whether or not the good or service is capable of being distinct. And the second criterion is asking us to question whether or not that good or service is distinct in the context of the contract. The standard lists the following indicators which an entity should consider in determining whether or not the second criterion has been met, i.e. whether or not the good or service is separately identifiable from other goods or services promised in the contract. This requires us to consider, does the entity provide a service of integrating promised goods or services into a bundle which represents the combined output for which the customer has contracted to receive? Or asks us to consider, does one or more of the goods or services modify or customize other promised goods or services in the contract? Or are the goods or services highly interdependent or interrelated with other promised goods or services in the contract? These are indicators that it as to whether or not a good or service is then separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. This has, however, been one of the areas which has been addressed by the boards in their clarifications, so we will come back to this later on. Some simple examples illustrating this concept of a distinct performance obligation. Let us just consider a cell phone contract. Consider your handset and your contract to receive network services providers. If I walk into a cell phone provider or a cellular network services provider, call them Vodi, to buy a handset, would that handset be distinct? Firstly, can I use the handset on its own or together with other resources which are quite easily available to me? And the answer would be yes. If I consider that it's an iPhone 7, let's assume, I can connect it to Wi-Fi to get connectivity or I could connect it to network services either from Vodi or I could walk over the road to Telki and take out a network service contract with them. Secondly, is the handset separately identifiable? Does Vodi integrate the phone with something else that they are offering me or promising me in terms of this contract? Or is the phone dependent on me receiving something else from Vodi? And the answer is no. Thus, the handset is going to represent a distinct performance obligation. You can contrast this scenario to another where the handset, for example, does not have Wi-Fi capability and it is possibly locked or it is locked to Vodi's network. You can then see how my answer would differ. If I do not then take the network services from Vodi, the phone will have no use to me. It is neither capable of being distinct nor distinct in the context of the contract. In the second, this latter case, the phone, together with the network services that I'm contracted to receive from Vodi, would amount to a single performance obligation. Step three then requires us to determine the transaction price. The transaction price is defined as the amount of consideration to which an entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring the promised goods or services to the customer, and it will exclude amounts collected on behalf of third parties. It provides detailed guidance on four areas regarding the determination of the transaction price. The first one we're going to quickly recap is variable consideration. FS15 requires an entity to estimate any variable consideration included in the transaction price, and this estimation should be performed at contract inception. For example, if there is any, any contingent consideration, discounts, volume rebates, performance bonuses or penalties, etc. This may result in earlier revenue recognition than what we see currently today. As many entities today wait until that uncertainty is resolved or the contingent event takes place before including or even determining the variable component of their revenue number. There is detailed guidance contained in IFRS 15 regarding how to estimate your variable consideration and how to determine what of this amount should be included in your transaction price, but we won't recap this this morning. Another area addressed in IFRS 15 is that dealing with a significant financing component. The standard requires one to adjust the promised amount to reflect time value of money if the contract has a financing component that is considered to be significant to the contract. Note that this is equally applicable if either party is receiving the benefit of financing. We are all quite familiar today with accounting for interest on a credit sale transaction to our customer. Ultimately, when an entity is providing the benefit of financing to their customers by granting them extended payment terms. However, IFRS 15 also now acknowledges that it may be the entity itself who is receiving the benefit of financing. For example, in situations where the entity is receiving an upfront or an advance payment, which is then allowing for them to finance their work in progress. 
If you think that this is applicable to you, we recommend that you familiarize yourself with the guidance in the standard, as there are some exemptions and practical expedients worth noting. Where consideration is the form of something other than cash, the guidance contained in IFRS 15 is quite similar to that which we have today. The transaction price is measured at the fair value of the non-cash consideration received or receivable. If you cannot reasonably estimate the fair value of the non-cash consideration, then it should be measured indirectly with reference to the standalone selling price of the goods or services transferred. The last area which was included, which we haven't yet covered in step three, is whether there is consideration paid or payable to a customer. In general, this consideration is to be deducted from the revenue number. Unless the entity is receiving a distinct good or service from the customer in exchange for this amount which is paid or payable to the customer. That is it for a recap of step three. Step four in the model now requires us to allocate the transaction price which we've determined in step three to the identified distinct performance obligations which we have identified in step An entity must allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations in an amount that depicts the amount of consideration it expects to be entitled to in exchange for transferring those goods or services. IFRS 15 requires the allocation to be based on the relative standalone selling price for each distinct performance obligation. Different to what we have today, because IS 18 is not prescriptive as to how revenue should be allocated to multiple elements identified. Methods which are often used today is an allocation based on relative fair value. Then there is also the cash cap method as well as the residual method of allocation. Going forward, IFRS 15 requires allocation to be based on the relative standalone selling prices of the transferred goods or services. This may require an entity to estimate the standalone selling price in cases where there is no directly observable selling price for a good or service which is transferred. The standard provides guidance on acceptable methods which can be used by an entity in estimating or determining the standalone selling price. The acceptable methods identified include the adjusted market assessment approach, expected cost plus margin approach, or in very rare circumstances, a residual approach may be used in the determination of the standalone selling price. An example of how this allocation method can be done can be seen on the current slide. Assume A, B, and C have been identified as distinct performance obligations. If they are sold separately, A will sell for 9 Rand, B for 11 Rand, and C for 20 Rand. Combined, you can see the sum of their standalone selling prices is 40 Rand. However, in this current transactions, they are being sold to a customer at a 10% discount. They are being sold at 36 Rand. The standard requires this 10% discount or this 4 Rand discount to be applied proportionately based on the relative standalone selling prices of each performance obligations. This is going to result in the revenues as indicated on the right hand side of the slide being the revenues which are going to be recognized as and when each performance obligation or each deliverable is transferred to the customer. Step five of the model then deals with the actual timing of revenue recognition. IFRS 15 requires revenue to be recognized as or when a performance obligation is satisfied and this is based on when control of the good or service is transferred to the customer. Irrespective of whether a good or service is being transferred to the customer, the same assessment shall be performed. Firstly, it's necessary to determine whether or not the overtime revenue recognition criteria have been met, and if not, that is then an indicator that revenue is going to be recognized at a point in time. The revenue standard requires us first to determine whether or not revenue should be recognized over time, and there are three criteria that should be considered, or three questions which need to be asked. Firstly, does the customer receive and or consume the benefit as and when the entity performs, and no other person or entity would need to come in and re-perform the entity's performance? If the answer is yes, then you qualify for overtime revenue, rec revenue recognition. So this criterion is to capture your typical service type contracts that we have today. For example, if you consider a cleaning service, a company that I engage with who comes in to clean my floor, my building, for example, I receive the benefit and consume the benefit as and when that entity is performing the cleaning service and nobody is required to come in and re-perform the service that they've completed for me.
The second question asks, does the entity's performance create or enhance an asset which the customer already controls? If the answer to this is yes, you then qualify for overtime revenue recognition. This criterion is to capture your construction type contracts that we have today. So where the customer, for example, already owns the land on which a house is being constructed or built. As foundations are being laid onto the land, ownership already passes to the customer. The third criterion is the one which is a bit more tricky and has two aspects to be considered. Firstly, does the entity's actions create an asset which has no alternative use? And does the entity have a right to payment for work that has been performed to date at all points throughout the contract? What does it mean to create an asset though with no alternative use? This means that the entity cannot redirect the asset to any other customer or for any other use. This could be as a result of both or either a contractual restriction built into the contract. It could be a practical restriction as a result or given the nature of the asset which is being produced or manufactured. To have a right to payment means that at any stage throughout the contract, the entity is to be entitled to be reimbursed for performance to date, which means that they should be able to be reimbursed for costs incurred plus a reasonable margin. If the response to both of these questions is yes, that there is an asset that has no alternative use and the entity has a right to payment, then the overtime revenue recognition criteria has been met. The response to those three questions asked above has been no. Then should revenue be recognized at a point in time? It is then necessary to determine at what point in time does control of the said good or service get transferred to the customer. Indicators listed in the standard to be considered to determine at what point in time revenue should be recognized are listed on the slide. You can see now how risks and rewards is only a factor to be considered in determining at what point in time revenue should be recognized. This, diff this is somewhat different to today, where in, this, in the case of the sale of goods, risks and rewards is the indicator as to when revenue should be recognized. Once an entity has determined that revenue should be recognized over time, revenue should be recognized by measuring the progress towards complete satisfaction of each separate performance obligation. Measures of progress available under the new standard are similar to that which we see today. For example, your input methods and your output methods. IFRS 15 provides additional guidance on a number of other areas where IS 18 and IS 11 are either silent today or provide very limited guidance. Specific guidance is included in IFRS 15 for what is termed a material right, which replaces guidance which we have in IFRIC 13 today dealing with customer loyalty programs. IFRS 15 also acknowledges that there are two types of contracts which could be associated to contracts with customers and requires these costs, sorry, that there are two types of costs which are associated to contracts with customers and requires that these costs are capitalized and are amortized over the contract period. These include costs incurred to acquire a contract, they would be capitalized as contract acquisition costs, for example sales commissions paid to staff for obtaining a contract. The second is known as fulfillment costs, so these are costs which an entity might incur which is going to actually um, assist them in completing or transferring the performance obligations at a future point in time. Further, there is specific guidance included for, con for warranties provided as part of the contract with the customer. There may be cases where a warranty, which goes beyond a standard warranty for latent defects, which could result in a separate performance obligation being recognized. IS 18 and IS 11 provide very limited guidance as to how to account for a contract modification or variation to the contract after the inception of the contract. A contract modification is said to be a change in price or a change in scope or both, which takes place or occurs after contract exception. IFRS 15 acknowledges that there are three different scenarios and provides guidance as to how each should be accounted for. Firstly, if there is a modification which adds additional distinct performance obligations priced at their, at their respective standalone selling prices, that modification is said to be accounted for as a new contract, so it is prospectively. The second is if at modification date the remaining performance obligations are distinct from those already transferred but these additional performance obligations are not priced at their standalone selling price, 
then you must treat the old contract as being cancelled and then take the remaining and the new performance obligations and treat them as a new contract going forward. Again, it is a prospective adjustment or prospective accounting. The third scenario is if at modification date the remaining performance obligations are not distinct from those which have already been transferred, irrespective of how they are priced. In this case, it is a retrospective adjustment, and you need to adjust revenue at the date of the modification on a cumulative catch-up basis. Given how times are changing, IFRS 15 now specifically addresses and provides guidance on the licensing of intellectual property, which I refer to as IP going forward. Guidance in the initial version of the standard identifies two types of licenses of IP, a right to use and a right of access. A right of use is said to be representative of a static license, meaning that the customer has the right to use the license as it is at the point in time at which they obtain control of that license, and this is going to give rise to a point in time revenue recognition. The second type, a right of access, this is said to be when a customer receives a right to access the license, which includes any transformations or changes to that license over the time at which they have access to that license and this is then going to give rise to an overtime revenue recognition pattern. The standard provides three criteria which need to be considered and need to be met for there to be a right of access type of licensing of IP. Firstly, the contract requires or the customer reasonably expects that the entity is going to undertake activities that are going to significantly affect the intellectual property or the IP. These rights expose the customer to any positive or negative effects of these activities and those activities do not themselves result in their transfer of a good or service. This, however, has been one of the areas for which there has been clarification made by the boards. IS 18 contains guidance for principal versus agent assessments. This may be relevant in cases where someone else is performing on your behalf, and this impacts whether or not an entity is going to recognize revenue in a gross amount, they are going to recognize gross revenue and gross costs, this is in the case where an entity has been identified as acting as the principal, or whether or not an entity is required to recognize revenue in a net amount, in the case of an entity being identified as being the agent. IFRS 15 included guidance to state that an entity is the principal if they control the good or service before that good or service is transferred to the customer. However, there were indicators included in Appendix B of IFRS 15, which were to be considered to determine whether or not an entity is acting in the capacity as an agent and therefore does not control the good or service before it is transferred to the customer. These indicators can be seen on the slide. There was, however, some confusion which has been noted by various stakeholders because they said the principle introduced by IFRS 15 is asking us to identify who is acting as the principle in controlling the goods or services before they are transferred. However, the indicators are the same as those which were included in IS 18, which are to to be considered in determining who is acting as the agent. So there is a bit of a disconnect. This again is one of the areas which has been addressed by the boards as part of the clarifications. Now that we have recapped the five steps of the model and looked at the other areas for which additional guidance has been provided in IFRS 15, we are now going to look at what has changed as part of the clarifications which have been issued by the ISB in April 2016. As I mentioned earlier, there were five issues which the TRG flagged to the boards as being areas where different views on the implementation of the standard were noted. These five areas were identification of performance obligations, which is part of step two, and in particular, the second criterion as to whether or not a good or service is distinct if it is separately identifiable from other promised goods or services. The principal versus agent considerations, the guidance dealing with licensing of IP, the collectability criterion, which is one of the criterion identified in step one for determining as to whether or not a contract with a customer exists, as well as the measurement of non-cash consideration, which is part of step three in determining the transaction price. The TRG also suggested to the boards additional relief to be provided to preparers on the transition to the standard. The boards discussed the five issues and the transition practical expedience based on the feedback from the TRG and each board decided to make amendments respectively. The ISB made amendments with respect to three of the issues, the identification of the performance obligations, principal versus agent considerations, as well as the guidance dealing with the licensing of IP. And they concluded that changes regarding collectability and non-cash consideration 
were not required. The ISB did, however, include the practical expedience for transition relief to preparers. We shall look into the detail of these clarifications over the next few slides. The TRG discussed issues regarding the identification of performance obligations, in particular regarding when a promised good or service is separately identifiable, i.e. it is distinct in the context of a contract, and the supporting factors as indicated on the slide. The discussion informed the boards about potential diversity in stakeholders' understanding and indicated that there was a risk of the factors being applied more broadly than intended by the boards, which is going to result in more promised goods or services being inappropriately combined and accounted for as a single performance obligation. In light of the TRG discussions, the ISB was initially of the view that the discussions highlighted educational leads and given the nature of the issues raised, amendments to IFRS 15 itself were not required, but however rather that the examples accompanying IFRS 15 could be clarified to illustrate the application of the requirements. Consequently, in the expo ex exposure draft of the clarifications to IFRS 15, the ISB proposed that some new examples be included and also proposed to amend some of the existing examples that are accompanying IFRS 15. The FASB, however, decided to propose amendments to their Topic 606 to clarify the guidance uh, relating to the identification of performance obligations. In particular, their proposed amendments included expanding the articulation of the separately identifiable principle and reframing the existing factors to align them with the amended principle. Some respondents to the ISB's exposure draft asked for the same amendments proposed by the FASB to be incorporated into, into IFRS 15. They expressed concerns about differences in wording between the IFRS and the US GAAP and also indicated that the FASB's proposed amendments would improve the understanding and reduce their diversity expected in practice. Although the wording described in the separately identifiable principle has been amended, the amendments clarify the board's intention and are not intended to change the underlying principle. The board observed that the underlying principle requires judgment and takes into account facts and circumstances. Even after amending these factors, the boards recognized that judgment will still need to be used to determine whether a promised good or service is distinct within the context of the contract. The boards decided to reframe the factors to more clearly align them with the revised wording of the separately identifiable principle. These amendments can be seen as indicated in the red text on the slide. These amendments are intended to convey that an entity should evaluate whether its promise within the context of a contract is to transfer each good or service individually or a combined item that comprises of the individual goods or services promised in the contract. Therefore, entities should evaluate whether the promised goods or services in the contract are outputs or instead are inputs into a combined item. For example, in a contract to build a wall, the promise to provide bricks and the promise to provide labor are not separately identifiable within the context of the contract because those promises together make up the promise for which the customer has contracted to receive, ultimately the constructed wall. Thus the bricks and labor are merely inputs into the combined output, being the wall. Thus the bricks and the labor are not separately identifiable. The wording of the factors has been amended slightly such that they are no longer phrased in the negative. In summary, the principle as to whether or not a good or service is separately identifiable has not changed. Rather, the wording has just been clarified in order to appropriately convey the board's intentions. The next clarification we'll address deals with the guidance contained in the standard for the licensing of intellectual property. The TOG discussed various issues relating to the application of the licensing guidance as it was contained in IFRS 15. The main issues discussed related to determining the nature of an entity's promise in granting a license of intellectual property. In other words, what is it that the entity has promised to actually transfer to the customer? The scope and applicability of a sales-based and usage-based royalty exception. The effect of any contractual restrictions on the license and as to whether or not this impacts the determination and the identification of performance obligations. And when the guidance on determining the nature of an entity's promise in granting a license is applicable. The ISB decided to clarify the application guidance on licensing and the accompanying illustrative examples to improve their understandability to the user. IFRS 15 contains criteria which to be considered to determine the nature of an entity's promise when granting a license, whether or not it is to provide a right of access to intellectual property as it exists throughout the license period, 
which gives rise to overtime revenue recognition, or whether or not it is providing a right to use the entity's intellectual property as it exists at a point in time when the license is granted, which gives rise to revenue at a point in time. The guidance which has now been deleted explained that the determination of whether or not an entity's promise to grant a license provides the customer with a right of access or a right of use is based on whether or not the customer can direct the use of and obtain substantially all of the remaining benefits from a license at a point in time when the license is granted. A customer can direct the use of and obtain substantially all of the benefits from the IP if the IP to which the customer has rights is not significantly affected by activities of the entity. In contrast, a customer cannot direct the use of and obtain substantially all of the remaining benefits from the license at a point in time if the intellectual property to which the customer has rights changes throughout the license period. The intellectual property will change when the entity continues to be involved with the IP and undertakes activities that are going to significantly affect the IP to which the customer has rights. The ISB decided to rather clarify the requirements by providing additional application guidance on what activities are said to change intellectual property to which the customer has rights in such a way that the ability of the customer to obtain benefits from the IP is significantly affected, which is going to result in overtime revenue recognition. Stakeholders agree that activities which are said to change the form or functionality of the IP would represent activities that affect the intellectual property to which the customer has rights and which are then going to give rise to overtime revenue recognition pattern. If the activities are expected to significantly change the form and functionality of the IP, those activities are considered to significantly affect the customer's ability to obtain benefits from the said IP. Thus, additional application guidance has been included in the standard uh, to, to help an entity identify whether or not these activities are said to change the intellectual property in such a way that the ability of the customer to obtain benefit from the IP has been or will be significantly affected. The following application guidance has been included. The ISB has, however, not defined the term significant standalone functionality, but has clarified some of the illustrative examples to illustrate when the intellectual property to which the customer has rights might be or might have significant standalone functionality. The ISB noted, however, that an entity may need to apply judgment in determining whether or not IP to which a customer has rights has significant standalone functionality. Worth noting is that the FASB has developed a slightly different approach to this, and the, the, the FASB has decided that IP is either going to be functional or symbolic, and that this distinction would impact whether or not revenue should be recognized at a point in time or over time. The next area for which there has been clarification is the principal versus agent assessment. As I mentioned previously, a new definition or concept of principal has been introduced into the standard. However, the indicators that were included in the application guidance were the same as those contained in IS 18. Some stakeholders asked whether control is always the basis for determining whether or not an entity is a principal or an agent, and how the concept of control and the indicators should work together. Other stakeholders asked how to apply the control principle to contracts involving the transfer of intangible goods or services. In light of those discussions and the feedback received from the TRG, the boards discussed and decided to clarify the principal versus agent guidance by making the same targeted amendments to the application guidance and to illustrated examples. So there is convergence between the ISB and the FASB with regards to these clarifications. Because of the concerns highlighted in the TRG's discussions, the boards decided to clarify the following aspects in the application guidance on the principal versus agent assessment. Firstly, the relationship between the concept of control and the indicators. And secondly, the application of the control principle when there is the case of the transfer of intangible goods and services. When another party is involved in providing goods or services to a customer, the amendments to the application guidance clarify how an entity determines whether it is acting as principal or an agent. These amendments focus on the need to appropriately identify the actual goods or services that is being transferred, which is being termed the specified good or service. Then secondly, to determine whether the entity um, has promised to transfer the, the specified good or service itself, or to arrange for the specified good or service to be provided to the customer by another party, who in this case would be the agent. Then the entity determines the nature of its promise on the basis of whether the entity controls that specified good or service before the good or service is then transferred to the customer.
the board's decided to refer to the term of the specified good or service uh, being transferred to the customer rather than the performance obligation because they thought using the term performance obligation in this case may be confusing if the entity is acting as the agent. Firstly, the standard requires an entity to determine whether or not it is a principal or an agent on the basis of whether the nature of the entity's promise is a performance obligation to provide the specified goods or services itself or to arrange for those goods or services to be provided by another entity. Assessing whether the entity controls a specified good or service before it is transferred is the basis for determining the nature of the entity's promise. Application guidance has been included as to how to address the nature of the promise and requires an, uh, requires an entity to identify the goods or services which are going to be provided and then to assess whether or not it is controlling the these goods or services before they are transferred to the customer. Further, the application guidance is now also expressly states that when an entity is acting as a principal and satisfies a performance obligation, it recognizes revenue in the gross amount of consideration to which it expects to be entitled to in exchange for transferring those goods or services. The TOG's discussions highlighted concerns about the application of this control principle to services to be provided to the customer. Questions discussed included how an entity could control a service before that service is transferred to the customer, because a service typically only comes into existence the moment that it is actually delivered. The boards observed that an entity can control a service to be provided by another entity when it controls the right to the specified service from that other party that will be provided to the customer. The entity then either transfers the right to the service to the customer or uses its right to direct the other party to provide the service to the customer on the entity's behalf. The boards observed that where the specified good or service to be provided to the customer is a right to goods or services to be provided in the future by another party, the entity would determine whether its performance obligation is a promise to provide a right to goods or services or whether it is arranging for another party to provide the right. The fact that the entity will itself not provide the goods or services is not determinative. Instead, the entity is to evaluate whether or not it controls the goods, the right to receive the goods or services before that right is transferred to the customer. In doing so, it is often relevant to assess whether the right is created only when it is obtained by the customer or whether the rights or goods to services exist before the customer obtains the right. If the right does not exist before the customer obtains it, an entity would be unable to control that right before it is transferred to the customer. The boards also observed that specified good or service to which the control principle applied should be, should be a distinct good or service, or a distinct bundle of goods or services. If individual goods or services are not distinct from one another, then there may be, for example, merely inputs into a combined output which is the, and it's the combined output, which is a single promise being made to the customer. Consequently, for contracts in which goods or services are inputs into a combined output for which the customer has contracted to receive, the entity needs to assess whether or not it controls the combined out output or the, com the combined out item before it is transferred to the customer. The boards concluded that when an entity provides a significant service of integrating two or more goods or services into a combined output that is a specified good or service for which the customer is contracted to receive, it controls that specified good or service before it is transferred to the customer. The text on the slide has all been added as part of these clarifications. Lastly, the boards address the indicators contained in the standard, and the changes can be noted by the red text as indicated on the slide. The boards observed that the questions about the relationship between the assessment of control and the indicators of control arose because the indicators were carried forward from IS 18. The board's considerations highlighted that the indicators included to support the entity's assessment of whether it controls a specified good or service before it transfers, and this might actually be difficult. The indicators do not override the assessment of control and they should not be viewed in isolation and do not constitute a separate or an additional evaluation and should not be considered as a checklist of criteria which need to be met. Considering one or more of the indicators will often be helpful and depending on the facts and circumstances, individual indicators may be more or less relevant in the determination of control. The boards decided to carry over some of the indicators in previous revenue recognition standard, even though those indicators have a different purpose under IFRS 15.
In IFRS 15, the indicators are to support the concepts of identifying performance obligations and the transfer of control of goods or services. The boards had expected that some of the conclusions about principal versus agent under IFRS 15 could be different to some scenarios to those reached under previous revenue recognition standards. The boards decided to amend the indicators to more clearly establish a link between the concept of control and the indicators. They reframe the indicators as indicators as to when an entity controls a specified good or service before they are transferred, rather as indicators that an entity does not control the specified good or service, i.e. no longer from the perspective of an entity acting as agent. They added additional guidance to explain how each indicator supports the assessment of control as defined, which should help entities apply the indicators. They remove the indicator relating to the form of the consideration. Although that indicator might sometimes be helpful in assessing whether an entity is agent, the boards concluded that it would not be helpful in assessing whether or not an entity is acting as principal. In addition, they also removed the indicator relating to the exposure of credit risk or to credit risk. The feedback from the exposure draft clarifications highlighted that exposure to credit risk is generally not a helpful indicator when assessing whether or not an entity controls a specified good or service. Stakeholders observed that the credit risk indicator in the previous revenue guidance has been problematic from the perspective of entities trying to use exposure to credit risk to override stronger evidence of agencies. Lastly, the boards clarify that the indicators are not an exhaustive list and they merely support the assessment of control and that they do not replace or override that assessment. So that summarizes the clarifications which have been made by the ISB to the standard. Just to recap, they have made clarifications to the guidance dealing with the identification of performance obligations, in particular the guidance around as to whether or not a good or service is separately identifiable, whether it is distinct in the context of a contract. In addition, they have made clarifications to the guidance uh, pertaining to the licensing of IP. And lastly, they have made clarifications to the guidance dealing with the principal versus agent assessment. It is worth noting that some of the amendments which have been made by the FASB are slightly different to that which have been made by the IASB. Thus, if you are a U.S. reporter or you have U.S. group reporting responsibilities, it may be worth familiarizing yourself with the FASB's amendments. So when is the standard and when are the clarifications effective? As I mentioned previously, the effective date of the standard has been deferred to be effective for years starting on or after 1 January 2018. The clarifications are effective at the same time. IFRS 15 provides two alternative transition approaches. Firstly, the full retrospective approach as indicated on the current slide. And second, the second alternative is a modified retrospective approach. Let's first look at the full retrospective approach. This is consistent with the requirements of IS8. This requires you to go and restate your comparatives retrospectively. There are, however, a few practical expedients which have been granted to preparers on adopting this transitional approach, as noted on the slide. The clarifications issued amended the transitional approach to add further practical expedient to permit an entity not to restate contracts that are completed contracts at the beginning of the earliest period presented. This practical expedient, if applied, would further reduce the number of contracts that require restatement on the initial application of the standard. Further, an additional practical expedient to simplify how an entity restates contracts with customers that have been modified prior to transition has been introduced which permits an entity to use hindsight when evaluating contract modifications when making the transition to IFRS 15. This additional practical expedient allows for an entity to reflect the aggregate effect of all past contract modifications when identifying performance obligations and determining and allocating the transaction price, instead of accounting for the effects of each contract modification separately. Under the second transitional approach, or the modified retrospective approach, this allows for an entity to not have to restate its comparatives in the first year of adoption, i.e. its comparatives can be reported under its existing accounting policies, for example under IS18. However, do not think that this is a get-out-of-jail-free card, because should this transitional approach be adopted, there are additional disclosures which are required to be made. The same practical expedient which has been included under the previous transitional approach regarding modified contracts prior to the date of adoption of the standard has been included under this transitional approach.
That brings to an end this morning's sessions and the discussion of the clarifications which have been made to IFRS 15, Revenue from Contracts with Customers.